roof just went on the house, man. The roof's gone. They have no roof. This is the legacy of Hurricane Iniki. Twisted, broken homes and shattered dreams. Over 6,000 homes were lost to Hurricane Iniki's winds, but Kauai started rebuilding almost immediately, due in part to the strength and resilience of Kauai's people. And Kauai's people have a lot to do with this video. I am Lee Cataluna of Kauai Newswatch. Private home videos from around the island capture the dramatic spectacle of Hurricane Iniki's winds, preserving it for all time. Kauai's people will be forever changed by Iniki, and they will continue to tell the tale of just what happened on that dark afternoon, September 11, 1992. This is their story. The island awoke to the wail of civil defense sirens at just after 5 on the morning of September 11. Already the surf of the island's normally calm south shore beaches foreshadowed the effects of the storm that was on its way. Each person on Kauai began bracing for what lay ahead, although no one could have known then the devastation that would come with Iniki's winds. Windows were secured to protect against broken glass. All around, Kauai was packing up, moving to shelter, and battening down the hatches. People rushed to the stores, hoping to stock up on essential survival articles, candles, flashlights, batteries, and non-perishable foods. Uh, we didn't get what we came for, but we just got as much food as we could get. We wanted to get candles and batteries, flashlights, but it's all sold out. Everything is sold out. And what wasn't sold out was bought out. Even non-essential items were being taken home by the armload and the cartload. While some people were successful in their shopping, others waited anxiously in lines, each hoping to get enough supplies to sustain their families through the worst, but still trying to smile and hope for the best. We were only letting people in when they clear everybody out. So they told us 45 minutes. Those who made it into stores were often disappointed. Emergency items were quickly bought out, and many had to go home with whatever they could find, hoping that would be enough. Lines also formed at gas stations around the island, adding to the traffic jams on Kauai roads. Many also realized that propane gas would be among the essentials that may be in short supply following a disaster. But the biggest line was here at Lihue Airport. While most prepared to ride out the hurricane, some headed to the airport in an attempt to get out before it hit. I was saying she wanted to get out of here. Yeah. I want to go home. <laughs> Although inter-island air carriers kept service going as long as they could, these people did not get flights off Kauai. They were taken to the nearest evacuation center to await the approaching Iniki. As the winds grew, so did the people's anxiety. At just before 10 a.m., Mayor Joanne Yukimura issued a statement via Kong radio station saying Kauai was going to bear the brunt of Hurricane Iniki. Yukimura ordered everyone off the streets by 10.30 a.m., everyone including police and emergency crews. For many, this order from the mayor was their first indication of the seriousness of the situation. The civil defense siren sounded for the last time at 11 a.m. By then, the last few cars were making their way to homes or shelters. Hurricane Iniki was on its way. By 1.30 in the afternoon, the monstrous winds had already begun ripping at the island. 
Only the brave or foolhardy were still out on the streets. Some, like these men, ventured out to witness the awesome power of Iniki, played out in the waves at Kealia. Iniki was unlike most major storms in recent times in that it occurred during the daylight hours. This, coupled with the popularity of home video cameras, made the Iniki experience possibly the most well-documented storm in history. All over the island, people grabbed their video cameras and shot the savage winds as they whipped through their neighborhoods. These videos captured the five hours of the ordeal through the eyes of those who survived it. Mike Garten was with some of his friends at the Kapa'a Sports Villas, and he watched as the storm made its imprint upon the landscape. In another part of Kapa'a, Rick Harder trained his camera on his neighbor's house, and he watched as the wind loosened the fabric of the structure. All over the island, as people peered out at the winds, they listened to the radio for any information that could aid in their safety. As phone lines were blown off poles and electricity failed, the lone radio station left in operation was Kong. On AM 57, uh, hurricane force winds happening, getting close anyway. Gusts of uh, 80 miles an hour at the airport. And uh, up to 84, in fact, registered. But we're, we've been, uh, we've had reports of 80 for quite a while, but we do, we do think that additional four mile per hour information, why not, we'll throw that in there. But uh, the gusts have been, uh, of course, reaching those high speeds, and that's where a lot of the damage occurs. How's it look out the window? The, the building, I don't believe it. That, that, the building right across the street just lifted up. Um, it's, it's back down now, but that, that was amazing. It just got, it picked itself up, about a 45 degree angle, and it came back down. This building right over here, where the, uh, I think it's an ice house, uh, the roof over, over that container. That just lifted up. So, see the faces in this place. <laughs> It's a very, if you don't know by now, and, and some of the folks that we've been talking to on the phone uh, are, are trying to get by it as, 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 as best can, as best they can get safe. Because if, if this is, if, if the worst is yet to come, we're in for uh, one heck of a, a storm and a ride. Lee, what do you have that? Here's the latest from uh, the National Weather Service says Hurricane Iniki is closing in on Kauai after brushing past Oahu, where no major damage was reported. Hans Rosendahl, who is a forecaster with the National Weather Service in Honolulu, says the storm is about as close as it's going to get to Oahu, but he said that for Kauai, the next three or four hours are very important ones. The eye of Iniki is approaching from the south at 20 miles per hour, with sustained winds of 125 miles per hour. Iniki's winds are gusting to 175 miles per hour. Parts of Kauai are already without electrical power, and phone lines are overloaded statewide. Residents and tourists are huddled in homes, hotels, at Red Cross shelters on Kauai and Oahu. Winds up to 50 miles per hour were reported on the west end of Kauai at midday. A 20-foot surf was reported in the Port Allen area where waves were crashing over highways in Poipu and Keikaha. The Weather Service office in Honolulu forecasts that the eye of Iniki will pass just east of Kauai at about 5 p.m. Forecasters say Iniki with sustained winds of 145 miles per hour could whip up hurricane force winds on Oahu. The hurricane was classified as Category 4 on a scale from 1 to 5 and was later upgraded to 5. And that is the latest from the National Weather Service. The word Iniki, we were told, means a sharp, piercing wind, a pinch, or more poetically, the pangs of love. And true to its name, this sharp, piercing wind caused broken hearts all over Kauai, as people saw their homes and everything they had destroyed. This footage was shot by Paul Miranda in Koloa, who, with his family members, watched their neighborhood being torn to pieces. While the winds blew on and on, Kauai police could only sit and wait out the storm and hope that their loved ones at home would be all right. Police, fire, and ambulance crews had to stay off the road during the storm because it was simply impossible for them to venture out. 
For many on the force, this was only the beginning of the longest day of their lives. And at this point, they still had no idea of the work that lay ahead for them. Over at the county building, the director of the Office of Economic Development, Glenn Sato, used his video camera to document the devastation. You will notice that the date on the footage is one day off. The historic county building provided a relatively safe haven from the demon outside. This video captures a phenomenon that several witnessed during the hurricane. Gusts of swirling winds like tornadoes within the larger context of the storm. It is said that this type of cyclone was responsible for quite a few roofs being chewed off. Also in Lihue, Dan Knott caught an overview of the town from his friend's apartment window. The Pay and Save Annex building, like many Lihue businesses, was brutalized by the storm. The roof of the ILWU building on Rice Street was also a casualty. No part of the island was spared by the destructive force of the wind gusts of 165 miles per hour. Here on the south side, the popular Brennikes Beach was pummeled by violent waves. Many Koloa residents who didn't dare stay at home brought their families to Koloa school. Most of the tourists staying in Poipu were taken to the shelter as well. One visitor shot this video. Look closely in the distance at the steeple of the historic First Assembly of God Church. <laughs> Meanwhile, several Southside videographers monitored the hurricane's impact. Yeah, more, each beam coming off. Not a first four, not even holding them. It went. There it went. I mean, uh, like a whole 10 feet. Oh, man. Bill Ballard took this dramatic footage of his neighbor's house in Oman. Oh, my God. Holy. Right there. Yeah. Oh, shit. Eric does it right now, folks. Oh, my God. The neighbor's roof is now blowing off their house. After losing the main part of his roof in his Koloa home, Tony Whitman could only watch as the water-filled ceiling finally collapsed. I mean, this whole house is going to go down. Look at the roof already. 
just grab things we want. Right now, I'm gonna grab the TV over there. One aspect of the hurricane that few people knew about were the raging floods that occurred in response to the rain and damage. Here at the Wild High in Poipu, the 22-foot wave surges swept around and through the hotel and traveled as far as 800 feet inland. This formed a rampaging river in the hotel parking lot as seawater poured in from the Poipu Beach area. Other major flooding occurred in upper Waimea Valley. This is never before seen footage of the destructive waters that came with the winds. Over in Eleele, Kauai Electric Citizen Utilities workers stayed at their power plant monitoring the storm as best they could. This footage is from Kauai Electric personnel. At one point, workers tried to secure a door to a warehouse from what appeared to be some unearthly monster forcing its way in. Iniki has been called a savage beast, an evil wind bent on senseless destruction. Many will only remember the storm for the terror and helplessness they felt. But others, like the man shooting this video, couldn't help but marvel at its power. Yeah, it's so awesome, but it is beautiful, too. In a way, it's just beautiful. It's nature. It's God. At the beautiful Hyatt on the South Shore's Shipwrecks Beach, the giant surf ate away at the oceanfront rooms and restaurants. It's not going to be there for long. The hotel guests and staff took shelter in the labyrinth of hallways in the basement of the main buildings, where they were hot but safe. Above them, Iniki roared through the resort. Further west in Hanapepe, Dustin Rubin kept watch on a rapidly deteriorating carport. Just prior to the passage of the eye, winds changed to a more southerly direction. Many agree that some of the worst damage occurred then when what had been loosened on one side got attacked from another angle. Did you get it? Yeah. Hawaii's North Shore was being hammered, too, but the storm was capable of rare displays of beauty. Kalihiwai Valley funneled high-velocity winds offshore, and the ocean looked as if the water was boiling as the winds blew spray out to sea like rising steam. Nick Moore, who shot this video, also took a drive up to the main highway near the entrance to Kalihiwai, an act that could have proved costly. The posh Princeville Resort Hotel was turned into an evacuation shelter. 
Tourists and North Shore residents huddled in the hotel's elegant ballroom, setting up a crude camp in a room meant for much happier events. Princeville General Manager Fred Matty ordered his staff to do the best they could. Uh, it's difficult. This thing happened rather quickly, but uh, we are pretty well prepared for the number of people we're trying to take care of right now. 375 hotel guests and 1,200 North Shore residents took shelter from the storm here. Some ventured out into the carport, transfixed by what they saw. Many said just when they thought the wind had reached its strongest point and had to be subsiding, an even bigger gust would come along. The beautiful hotel-turned-survival bunker did not hold up well under Iniki's attack. The glass in the port cochere was shattered, as were many other windows. Huge holes were torn into the roof on the 11th floor of the main building. This broke the sprinkler system and water poured in. Half a million gallons of water flooded hallways and rooms. During all this, there was only one injury. Miraculously, during the height of the hurricane, some stragglers made the perilous journey from their damaged houses to the shelter at the hotel. These people crawled out of the rubble of their homes to flee to safety. The eye of the storm passed directly over Kauai after 3 o'clock. Different parts of the island experienced the center of Iniki at slightly different times. The eye brought an eerie stillness, and a number of people ventured out to survey the damage thus far. Before the last radio station was knocked off the air, broadcasters warned Kauai not to be foolish about the deceptive calm. We were reminded over and over again that there was more to come. And there was. Oh, we would have been right there. Oh, really? I don't know. God. That's right. There's no power in the lines. Yeah, go for it. We'll rip those suckers through and let's get out of here. The winds that came after the eye passed seemed more intense, but subsided more quickly than the first assault. When Iniki had finally left Kauai, people came out of their shelters to see what was left. One of the first stories of almost miraculous survival was discovered by a Kauai electric administrator who checked on a company warehouse. It is 6.15 in the afternoon. The storm is just now starting to abate on Kauai. This is a warehouse. And as you can see, the roof is gone. There is one lucky horse in this warehouse. Everything has crashed down around this horse. It was put in here for protection. And I guess he's protected. Here at the Kapa'a School Emergency Shelter, survivors didn't have to look far to see the effects of the hurricane. Trees formed roadblocks on the streets. Here across the high school gym, a home narrowly missed total destruction from a fallen pole. Fire units were out checking to see if there were any injuries. Some people tried to leave the shelter to check on their own homes, but this proved difficult for many.
pieces of tin roofing were strewn about the parked cars of the evacuees. Darkness fast approached, and much of the assessment would have to wait until daylight. Residents and visitors alike fell into a fitful night's sleep. Morning broke over Kauai with almost a cruel beauty. The September moon lingered to greet the daylight, and the air was calm and quiet. But for many, the ordeal was not over, but just beginning.
The toll Iniki took on beautiful Kauai was staggering. Almost every home sustained some form of damage. Over 2,000 homes were totally destroyed. 4,000 more were badly damaged. Over 5,000 utility poles were knocked down, blocking roads and cutting off communication totally. Most of the island was left without running water. Total damage estimate was set at $1.6 billion, making Iniki the third costliest storm in America's history. People sifted through the rubble, trying to see what could be salvaged. But Iniki not only took homes and dreams away, two lives were lost as a direct result of the storm. This Kilauea woman lost her father, Adeodoro Garcia, when he was hit by flying debris. Uh, we're trying to get out and go up to the neighbor, but then it's uh, a lot of debris flying, uh, flying flyboards. That's what my father got killed. The Garcia family ran across the street to Sybil Nishioka's house to seek shelter. It's about when the wind started getting really heavy, I had locked myself in the bedroom with my dog. And uh, when it was getting really bad, I heard knocking on the door, like screaming and pounding. And I couldn't believe someone was out in this. So I came out, and uh, it was my neighbors across the street. Apparently, the older gentleman, the father, Marcelina's father, had gotten hit in the head um, while their house was collapsing. So they stayed here during the duration, the rest of the storm, but he passed out after. It has been said over and over, though, that it was incredible that there were only two deaths amid this destruction. Kapa'a Elementary was one of the school's hardest hit on the island. Classrooms were torn open, schoolwork and art projects were blown away. Items dear to the students' hearts were gone. All over the island, pieces of tin roofing were cast about everywhere, decorating the roadside and the power lines. The garden island was not a garden anymore. What was a spectacular green before the storm was an angry, bruised brown. Kauai's foliage looked as if it had been burnt by fire and not the wind. Coconut trees fared well generally, but not so at the City of Refuge Heiau at Lydgate Park. Here in Kapa'a, you see the first evidence of the long lines that mark the post-disaster period. There were lines for food, lines for fuel, lines for ice. The first day after Iniki, several restaurants like Bubba Burgers in Kapa'a turned their misfortune into a community service. Without refrigeration to keep their food, Bubba set up a grill at Kapa'a Beach Park and gave free food to anyone that came by. Churches on the island were not spared by Iniki's fury. Although its roof was heavily damaged, church services at St. Catharines in Kapa'a went on with renewed faith. This was one of the worst hurricanes that I have ever gone through. However, it has brought back a lot of wonderful uh, spirit of the Aloha spirit. The people are very, very cooperative, and their, their great faith has brought them through this, and they are becoming more beautiful as we go along with our relationships.
Church usher Pete Favaloro was one of many whose home was destroyed. Our house is gone. Um, the sound of the wind is hard to describe. First of all, a, the roof from across the street came in, hit our lanai, and then the next thing we knew, the roof was gone. And then from then on, it was total destruction. The sound is hard. Like I said, it's hard to describe. Inside, it seemed as though nothing escaped damage, except a mirror on the dining room wall. Well, I tell you what, we can thank God. We're physically and psychologically okay. You come from that, that, that's asking a lot if you want more. As with Hurricane Eva in 1982, Iniki savaged the Poipu coastline. Oceanfront properties were swept from their foundations in such great numbers that many will surely question the feasibility of rebuilding here. What houses remained were battered beyond repair. The National Guard was asked to come to Kauai even before the hurricane touched land, and their presence was warmly welcomed on the island. Helicopters brought in emergency supplies, and guards kept the peace in communities that were shattered by loss. In the midst of the chaos, the military presence provided a comforting sense of order for many. Everything being under control. Uh, we had some looting here and there, but uh, overall uh, it's been controlled and uh, been quite nice so far. The cleanup started immediately and soon Kauai was bustling with activity. Everywhere there were the signs of life. Kauai's aloha spirit was what carried the island through the first brutal days after the hurricane. And soon outside help was pouring in. Kauai was on the way to recovery. Feeding centers were set up island-wide, staffed by the Salvation Army, Red Cross, military personnel, and local volunteers. Food and emergency supplies were passed out to those who stood in line. The island was declared a federal disaster area, and Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, sent representatives to Kauai to lead in the recovery effort. Even FEMA board member Marilyn Quayle, wife of Vice President Dan Quayle, came to assess the situation. Kauai received national attention. Reporters from around the country converged on the island. This media coverage inspired people from all around the state and all around the nation to send relief supplies and donations. Mayor Yukimura held daily press briefings on the status of the recovery effort. A major milestone in the post-hurricane period was the arrival of the first load of generators to be sold. Generators were a valuable commodity as people couldn't bear the thought of doing without electricity for what may be many weeks. But along with the luxury of a generator came the price of noise pollution in neighborhoods and tempers flared as neighbors disagreed when was an appropriate time to turn off a generator at night if one should be turned off at all. The reopening of banks marked another step in the recovery process. With greater access to their money, people were better able to get the emergency supplies they needed. However, the reopening of some establishments caused so much excitement that traffic gridlock was created. Everyone wanted to go to the Golden Arches when they started serving. Traffic congestion became a major issue as people drove around looking for supplies and emergency assistance without the aid of modern communications. In response to this problem, the county created the Iniki Express Bus Service, Kauai's first island-wide bus system with free rides for everyone, seven days a week. The system incorporated tour bus companies and school buses in the federally financed program. Everyone's heroes were the military personnel. They brought food, baby items, and willing and able hands to assist in the cleanup. At its largest, the military presence on Kauai topped 6,000 troops, including Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, and Guard. Pacific Missile Range personnel were at the heart of the West Side survival. 
The USS Bello Wood brought in field kitchens, Humvees, military trucks, and the personnel to staff them. The most daunting recovery work belonged to Kauai Electric. The island's only utility company lost over 5,000 poles, and cables and connections were hopelessly twisted. KE brought in crews from Oahu, Maui, the Big Island, and the mainland, and contracted with other war crews to get the island hotted up again. The work was slow going at first, and crews were on the job seven days a week, sunrise to sunset. Kauai soon learned how essential electricity is to our daily lives. The line crews, like much of Kauai, kept their spirits up with as much levity as safety would allow. After a very few days, rubbish from the cleanup was becoming a problem. The county implemented emergency satellite dumping sites in each community to handle the mountains of refuse. Giant trenches and nonstop fires created an apocalyptic inferno as the blackened smoke blotted out the sun. And still, Kauai smiled. Debris removal was too much for residents to do alone, so Operation Garden Sweep began. Military personnel were called in, white gloves and all, in an organized neighborhood-by-neighborhood -neighborhood cleanup. <laughs> With communication systems so badly damaged, Kauai's lifeline became this radio station. Kong Radio miraculously managed to get back on the air just two days after the storm and was then swamped with a constant stream of information from official sources and from people trying to check on their loved ones. Part of the recovery was just covering up thousands of leaking roofs. Plastic and most noticeably blue tarps decorated the landscape in anticipation of the fast approaching winter rains. Phone company crews scrambled to make repairs to all parts of Kauai. Their work was further complicated after the hurricane when heavy rains damaged some circuits that had survived Iniki's initial assault. While phone service was down, GTE Hawaiian Tel set up emergency phone banks around the island, giving residents free local and long distance calls to anywhere around the world. The lines were very long, and here in Kapa'a, the ever-present generator noise mixed with traffic close by was distracting, but to let a loved one know you're okay was worth the inconveniences. Just one week after Iniki, the primary elections were held and state elections officials ruled no exceptions or postponements could be made for Kauai. The voter turnout was lighter than usual, but at 53 percent, officials were proud that Kauai voters made the extra effort to come out at all. However, without a mayor's or governor's race on the ticket, the elections were largely forgettable. But what will prove to be unforgettable will be the spirit of the people of the island and those that gave from the heart to bring back beautiful Kauai. Iniki made heroes out of ordinary people, people who were on Kauai for the first time, people who had lived here all their lives. Neighbors and strangers were swept up in the intangible phenomenon called the Aloha Spirit. County officials had high words of praise for the relief effort. When the last winds of Iniki ceased blowing, um, it left a devastated island. All our electric and Phone lines were down and uh, there was almost no communication between and among parts of the island of Kauai. It was then that the spirit and spunk of the people of Kauai showed itself. Because all around the island, in communities as small as subdivisions or as big as towns, people began to band together and work together to meet the needs and the situations that were created by the hurricane. 
One of the Red Cross workers who came from Florida over to Kauai said he couldn't believe uh, the situation here on Kauai because in Florida people were just sitting waiting for government to come to their aid whereas here on Kauai citizens were not waiting they were taking the situation into their hands using whatever resources they could find or dig up and working together to help each other survive through those first uh, few crucial days and even into the days that we are facing right now. Never forget it. Over and over again, outsiders marveled at the resilience of the Aniki survivors. People like Domi and Carol Ragsack, who lost everything but refused to be anything but positive. The sliding glass door blew over here, the wind came rushing down the hall and popped out that sliding glass door, and then uh, Domi here was locked in I was in locked the in the back bedroom. bedroom. And then I tried to open the door, and a door just flew off the, the, the hinges and it flew down the hallway. I ran into the smaller room here, and we we're kind of cuddling. All of a sudden, the drywall from the ceiling, which is very light, fell on our heads. And we, then we looked up, was white, bursting, uh, whirlpooling effect sky, I remember. They then made their way to a neighbor's house, where they all huddled in a stairwell, while that house also blew apart. In spite of their tragedy, though, they still had a song in their hearts. The roof, the roof came tumbling down. The roof, the roof came tumbling down. I looked out my window and the rags that roof flew by. Iniki, Iniki was a little bit sneaky. Iniki. Iniki was a little bit sneaky. She may get us down, but thank God we're still around. For those that survived Hurricane Iniki, the images of her aftermath will be forever burned into their minds. It was expressed by thousands of voices. Thank God we're still alive.
winds of destruction have also been the winds of change. This empty lot was the site of the historic Roxy Theater. It's gone now, another victim to the storm. But this parcel of land represents the opportunities that have arisen out of the rubble. Kauai has been scrubbed clean and primed for a new start. Everywhere you look, there are signs of new beginnings. And this holds true not only for Kauai's buildings, but for the people as well. Many will have new homes and new jobs, new philosophies of life but all will remember September 11, 1992 as a milestone in their lives. Because after Hurricane Iniki, whether good or bad, things will never be the same. Yeah. Yeah, it is. 